<laughs> warm and dry. Virtual. And virtual, virtual field trip. Yeah. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about climate, climate and weather related experiments and equipment around the headquarters area that you might see if you're walking around and, and or leading groups around. One of the projects that you'll see during the summer is, is the RAMPS. And, and RAMPS, we call it RAMPS, it's, it's an acronym for Rainfall Manipulation Project. And this is a project that actually started quite a while ago, uh, almost 15 years now, actually, with funding from USDA and Department of Energy initially to look at the potential impacts of changing rainfall patterns, changing climate on tall grass prairies. So it, it, it relates to the questions that I left you with. What would happen if we changed the frequency of storm events, the packaging of rainfall, and we changed temperatures, it got warmer? How would that influence grassland ecosystems? And so what we do is we have, we have these shelters where we can manipulate patterns of rainfall. They were erected over intact tall grass prairies. So this isn't, this isn't a planted artificial assemblage of plants. Basically what we did is we found an area in headquarters that's annually burned, um, dominated by the same plant species that we find in, in similar areas of Kanza. And we erected these shelters over top of that intact prairie. And it allows us to manipulate patterns of rainfall and temperature. So there are 12 of these sheltered plots and there are three non-sheltered controls that are down there as well. And what the, what the roofs allow us to do is we can collect, store, and reapply rainfall to mimic any sort of climate pattern or weather pattern that we want. So we can, we can look at different patterns and assess them, things like plant growth, uh, community changes, <coughs> the, the physiology or the health of the plants, carbon dioxide coming off the soil, a lot of different things. And since 1998, when we started this, we've had two basic patterns. Ambient means whatever the, the natural rainfall pattern is, that's what happens under, the, under that set of, 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 of shelters. So we have, six, we have six, 12 shelters, six of them are ambient, six of them are in an altered climate. For the ambient, if it, like it rained today, if we have the roofs up, um, tomorrow morning, one of our research assistants, Patrick or Jeff, would be out there applying the rainfall so that we get the same rainfall pattern over the course of the year under the shelters as outside. That's the ambient treatment. The altered treatment, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute, that's a more intense rainfall pattern. And we've, had, we have, we've also been doing warming. We added a heating treatment in 2003, so since 2003 we've been looking at warming as well. And you get some idea. So, so right now if you go down there, all you see are the shelter frames. But this is what it looks like in the, in the spring. Um, after we burn the plots and we have all our instruments set up again, we have to put the plastic roofs on. They're replaced every year because we only manipulate rainfall during the growing season. And you have, so you know when 75% of the rain falls here? Between April and October, or September. So that's our growing season, basically April to late September, early October. And on average, three quarters of the annual rainfall happens then. That's, a, that's our continental climate. Most of the rainfall comes during the growing season. <coughs> so in April, what we're doing is we're stretching plastic, kind of pull it really tight, and then we, it, it gets tacked down with this piece it's called wiggle wire. But we basically put the roofs on, and that allows us to then manipulate rainfall for the rest of the growing season <coughs> under those shelters. One thing you might see, there's a, there's, you can see a little bit exposed here. Because if you get a lot of rain, the water will move laterally, right? Even though we have roofs over these things, you would worry about water moving at some surface in and out of the plots. So when we set these things up, they were all trenched down to bedrock, to limestone bedrock, which is about a meter and a half in this area. And then the plots underneath here are all um, isolated with stainless steel with sheet metal walls. So they have barriers to prevent lateral flow of water in or out in and out of the plots too. So that does lets us do a pretty good job of controlling soil moisture underneath these. It's based on what comes down from above, not what comes in from the sides. Did you say this is only down for annual burns? Yeah, so, so the plots are all annually burned. So, and, and the reason we chose to do that was um, if, if you leave a litter layer on, like you don't burn it, you allow a litter layer to accumulate over time, it, would, it decreases the sensitivity to interannual variability in rainfall. We, we kind of know that already. 
So we wanted the set systems that would show the greatest response that would be the most sensitive. Plus, that, that is a very common management practice in the point hills, just to burn annually. The other problem would be because we've been running this experiment for now 15 years, and this area had been burned annually. If we stopped burning it at the start of the experiment, we would we know we would have changes in vegetation that would be happening because of the absence of fire, in addition to our treatments, and that would complicate the experiment too. <coughs> So what we do, this is, this, is, this is visually kind of think about our treatments. If we have a normal year with a regular rainfall pattern, this, this might represent, you know, there's small rainfall events, there's some large rainfall events mixed with them. Um, what we do though for our, our alter treatment is we, we take the normal time between rainfall events and we increase it by 50%, whatever that is. So if it's been four days between rainfall events, we increase it to six days. If it's been eight days, we increase it to 12 days. We just add 50% more between rainfall events based on the natural pattern. If it rains in those extra days, we pool all that water. We just hold it. It goes into those big black holding tanks. Then at the end of that longer dry period, we put all the rain back on. So over, over a growing season, there's no change in the total growing season quantity. The amount of rainfall is the same. It's just that instead of coming down in lots of different size events, it gets repackaged into fewer, larger storm events, which is the climate change prediction that we're interested in. What would happen if you didn't change the amount of rainfall, but the intensity of storms and the length of dry periods between them increased? So that's the basic experimental design. So you get fewer events and longer dry periods between them. That's, that's our major treatment. And this is what happens to soil moisture. So soil moisture is critical. It, it, it's, it's what ultimately determines plant productivity. It determines um, soil CO2 emissions, all those things. So if you think about, you know, I don't think there's anything as, such as a, as a typical year here, right? There's no, there's no typical year. <laughs> but if we had a, a typical year, if we averaged over a long period of time, usually what happens is we get wet in the spring. Okay? It, it wets up at the beginning of the growing season. We get a lot of rain. And then plants start to grow and they transpire. The soil starts to dry out a little bit. And in the summer is typically when we get our long, our driest periods. And then it starts to re-wet in the fall. So in a quote unquote typical year, we might have a pattern like this. We get some variability in soil moisture, these rainfall events. But the general pattern is we dry down and then it gets wet again in the fall. In our altered rainfall pattern, this is what happens. We have a series of dry downs during the growing season between rainfall events and then really intense re-wetting of the soil when it rains again. So what does that do to plant productivity? It turns out it doesn't always affect it, because remember, it, it depends on what the natural rainfall pattern is anyway. Um, that, was, that was our pre-treatment year. And, and the, the little asterisks would indicate years when there were significant differences between mm -hmm. treatments. And what we find is when we see significant differences, it's always that the altered rainfall pattern results in lower plant productivity. How much varies on what the natural rainfall pattern is, but on average we get a 12 to 22 percent reduction in, in plant productivity, even if we don't change the amount of rainfall just by repackaging it into larger storm events. So what that tells us is that if those climate change predictions turn out to be true, if we get fewer larger storm events with no change in rainfall amount, we can still expect to see a negative impact on plant productivity. In, so, in some years, it's equivalent to about a 30% decrease in rainfall, about a 30%. <coughs> so the take home message there is the timing of rainfall is as important as the amount of rainfall. And it's not just how much, it's also mm -hmm. we can get it and how it's distributed. Uh, curious, sometimes the uh, <coughs> The modified rainfall produces more, it seems like. A couple of, uh, like 2006, I don't know, excuse me. Oh, like rain right here? Uh, yeah, or, or two years later, uh, any idea why? Yeah, well, well, in neither case are those significantly different, so I don't know. I mean, it could just be natural interannual variability. So one of the things I'll tell you about working in Prairie 2 is that the variability here is, is high, and it's difficult to deal with that on an on a, on a, on a experimental basis sometimes. 
even in, in the ramps where we tried to set up in a small area that's relatively uniform, turns out having a rep at an end, so a sample size of six, six replicates, I wish we had 12 of each treatment. Because the more replicates you have, the more you can deal with that variability. Um, and so, you know, all I can tell you is that these are variable, they're not significantly different from one another. The only places where we got significant differences were all in Yeah. Yeah. Has the plant community distribution changed because of this difference? <coughs> yeah, or you know, is it too the, close, too soon to tell? We, that's, that was one of our predictions, is that the plant communities would change. And, and the reason is that the grasses, even though they're deep-rooted, some work by Jesse Nippert, the plant physiologist here, has shown the grasses get most of their water, their usable water, from the upper 25 centimeters or so, and really from the surface. The deep roots might be important for avoiding long-term impacts of drought or maybe other things, but most of their actual water use seems to come from the surface. And a lot of the forbs and woody plants that are tap-rooted get their water deeper in the soil profile. So one of the things that we predicted was the altered rainfall timing would favor the forbs and the taprooted plants because the surface soil dries out more between rainfall events. And when you get these big, large rainfalls, it recharges the whole soil, but you get more water down deep, and then the surface dries out again. So we figured that the forbs would increase. Um, and that was our prediction. We, we have not seen that. There's, there's some evidence that we're starting to see community shifts, but in the first 15 years, the take-home message is the community composition has been pretty resilient. So I'm not, I'm not going to show you a lot of details from the ramps. This is just showing that the variability in soil moisture does have a negative effect on productivity. Um, I, I mostly just want you to be familiar. Well, just a, mostly just want you to be familiar with the experiment. So you, if someone asks about it, you can explain to them what the basic, you know, what we're, what we're doing down there. Um, here you can again, you can see those barriers that hydrologically isolate the plots from the surrounding area. These are the big tanks that store water. When it rains, what happens is the rain flows off the roofs. We have gutters on both sides. The gutters direct the rainfall into the storage tanks. And then there are 13 overhead sprinklers. That's how we make it rain. You know, so it, 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 it comes down to a pretty realistic rate for you know, a moderate to heavy rainfall event. Um, underneath here, we also have these um, the metal uh, troughs, upside down metal troughs. In fact, these two lighter colored ones are infrared heaters. They're the same heaters that you would use, for example, in, in stables or barns. Um, and, and they're set up so that we can control the output from them using rheostats, and we can increase the temperature just about two, what, three and a half to two degrees C. It's a very modest increase in temperature, but it certainly is consistent with short-term climate change predictions. So we're not heating a lot, we're just raising the temperatures at a very modest, modest level. Yeah, what, the, the temperature, temperature is, Yeah, it's one and a half to two degrees centigrade. So that would be about three to four degrees Fahrenheit, not very much. And we have one of these as a dummy lamp. The idea is when you put these things up, you want, you know, if there is a small shading effect from having the lamp there, I don't think it really does much but we have a plot that we have a dummy lamp up in as well, so we can compare that. So two of them are actual heaters, one of them is just a shear. And then this is the area, it's a two by two meter area underneath where it's heated. And so then we measure plant growth, we measure soil <coughs> soil tuplex, there are devices for measuring soil moisture, soil temperature, all those things. And this is, I'll show you that they work. See? <laughs> so in the winter or in mornings when there's dew, you can actually, visibly see the heating effect. It's not very much, but it's there. Uh, do you realize the, uh, the composition of the soil by the nitrates? And yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. So, so what, what I can tell you about that is that um, we haven't seen a heating <coughs> effect yet. We, we see a heating effect on soil CO2 flux. So the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of the soil, is it's, it's a result of root and microbial activity. And that's temperature sensitive. We expected that warming would increase CO2 output because that's what you see in all the forest studies that have looked at warming. Warming increases respiration, increases CO2 output. 